Welcome. Thank you. Is my mic on? Yep. Right. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, no, good afternoon to the to the committee. Uh, thank you so much for this public hearing. Uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, draw the contrast between de jure and de facto. Um, when you have de jure, you have what's written in law. However, de facto is what happens in fact. When you say that businesses are not allowed to discriminate against people with felonies, however, that's on that's written down. What happens in reality is that, in fact, felons are discriminated against. And we know and understand this, and it's been testimony, and it's been stated with CCAP itself that this happens. And I think this further goes into allowing that, even though you're going to say that you, you're not guaranteed or you don't have to, by law, you're not allowed to discriminate still in this, by fact, it will only increase that level of discrimination. Uh, there are reasons, um, historical reasons, why we have strict scrutiny for race. And I think that this, um, this passage of this bill helps to, helps to uh, make that disparate impact even, even more desperate in that, in that factor. Because so many, uh, especially black men, are going to be incarcerated. We make up approximately 5% um, of the state's population. However, over 50% of the prison population are African American. Also, the state of Wisconsin is the number one incarcerator of black males on planet Earth. Mm. Not only uh, just in the, in the country, on the planet Earth, which mm. will des desperately impact us as um, money-making, family-supporting individuals within the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, I think if this is passed, you open yourself up to uh, some issues with being taken to court as well. I think there are some 14th Amendment issues with this bill, I think you violate, it, it looks to kind of violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment in the first section, and I think that it needs to be looked at. The state Supreme Court may, be, may come knocking on your door and say, hey, wait, we can't do this. Um, and I think that needs to be uh, taken into consideration as, as well. I don't know if you, Mr. Chair, or anyone else on the committee um, have ever been turned down for a job. Uh, a lot of times, even if you aren't a felon, um, you get a letter with nice flowery language telling you why you didn't get the job, or we didn't feel that your credentials matched up. We didn't feel that uh, we went with another candidate that we felt had a stronger resume, et cetera. And in their mind, the only thing that turned you down could have been the felony. However, they send you this information, and, and at that point, as the gentleman before me stated, your only recourse is to go to court. If you're out looking for a job, you don't have the resources necessarily to pay for an attorney. So you don't have the time resources to spend time in a courtroom if you even get that far. And furthermore, uh, it causes an undue stress upon an individual and upon a family to be involved in a long-term process like that. Um, also, uh, I think we need to have a public hearing in, in places where there are large amounts of people who are disparately impacted by the passage of this bill, especially places like Milwaukee County. Um, uh, where many of the uh, individuals who, who are returning felons would uh, go back to live. Also, I want it to be noted for the record that the author, the sponsor of this bill, Senator Alberta Darling, is not here. She is not present, and she has not been present since she testified. Right. Just for the record, I want that stated as well. That's right. Um, She's not here to hear the outrage of the people. I think we need to have more public hearings so that people can hear the outrage of oh, this bill, what's happening with it, and what the response would be as well. Um, she's not here to hear that, and I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that she's not here to hear that. Um, Ex-offenders can serve one purpose and one purpose only according to this bill. All you can do is get out of prison, and when you get fr too frustrated that you can't find a job and you don't, you run out of money, you can then commit another crime and go back to prison. Right. And make more money. It, it will create jobs. I, I, I will add that. It will create jobs. The job that it's going to create is the prison guard who watches that person when they go back to prison. Mm -hmm. the, the company that's going to build the new prison. There have, been, there have been floor sessions in this very building um, for hours on end um, about prison systems and not one mention of crime and justice. It's always been about who's going to get the benefit of the prison being built in my district so I can get money, so we can count those people as members of my, of my society even though they're locked up. Um, also, uh, I want to add a little bit of data um, that America has 5% of the world's population. Uh, only 25%, there are 25% of prisoners worldwide. 
Uh, nearly 2.4 million people are incarcerated in the world's highest incarceration rate in the United States, which has, which has tripled in 20 years. 29% of the U.S. population has a criminal record. One in four adults in America, or 92 million Americans. Uh, as of 2006, America had a felon class of more than 16 million felons, representing 75, 70, 7.5% of the adult population. This number is likely closer to 20 million fel felons today. Unemployment among Americans with a criminal record exceeds 50%, between $57 billion and $65 billion lost in output. This is from a book called A Felon's Mirror. And lastly, before I leave, I want to leave you with this note, uh, stating that businesses can do not have to discriminate. They're not required to discriminate. Uh, however, uh, it's like saying that I have a house and I build a fence around it and I have 10 dogs in it. And I say, my dogs don't necessarily have to leave my yard, but I'm going to leave the gate open. <laughs> so I shouldn't be surprised when I come back and all my dogs are gone. That's right. <laughs> and lastly, I want to state that when I sat in the Community Correctional Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a plea deal away from being a felon myself, I sat with a group of five young men, all of whom were felons. The youngest was 17 years old. He received a felony for fleeing the police. He received a felony fleeing at 17 years old. What am I supposed to say for a young man like that? What does this bill say for a young man like that when you, he goes to look for, an, for a job? When he goes to turn his life around, he hadn't even finished high school yet. When he goes to turn his life around and try to, to uh, repent or to try to get some correction for what he had done and say, well, I want to go to college or I want to do something. I want to be a productive citizen in life. What do we say when we have uh, uh, bills like this who won't, in essence, won't allow this young man to have a job? And, and basically, he'll have to go back to his criminal job, which will land him back in prison. Mm -hmm. What do we say? And that's not an open-ended question. If you want to answer that question, you can. And with that, I'll, I'll take any questions if you have any. Mm -hmm. Any questions by anybody on the phone? Answer the question. <laughs> no question. No question. No question. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Senator King. <laughs> Next up, we have.